Go. Hello, hello. Hey there. Uh, hi, I'm Cole, and this is Josh yep. for the first time on screen. Not well, that's not true, but. First time on this particular screen, I think. Yeah. I've been on other leader games related screen, screen, screens. So. Screens, screens and streams. <laughs> screens and streams. Uh, you are watching the January edition of the designer chat, the studio chat that we try to do on the first uh, Tuesday of each month. Obviously, it's not the first Tuesday of the month. We moved this one back a week just so everybody could catch their breath after the new year and we can kind of uh, stew a little bit on what we want to talk to, talk about. Uh, we have Josh with us today because, um, you know, about twice a year he comes to visit and we work on some studio stuff. It's just also nice to have folks who are normally remote, like in the studio for a week or so, just to kind of see how, how everything's going and work on some projects. Um, and so we're happy to have him. It seemed like a nice time to get him in front of a camera. Absolutely. So good. Let's see all the folks there. So, you know, uh, for folks who haven't done this while, you know, it is a new year, so we can give the kind of opening prompt. Uh, we're just kind of here to answer any kind of questions you might have. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we've been playing, the kind of games we've been thinking about, and then uh, and some of the kind of back end studio stuff. And then we'll also talk about projects we're working on right now. And we are happy to answer your questions whenever. So if you have a question, you can you can put it up there on the on, on the chat. And if you see Josh and I looking over like yeah. this, it means I, that we're looking at the questions and reading them. I am the bully who keeps things in check. I, I <laughs> yes. try to, at least. I tend to be the bad cop in, in certain situations. So. I feel like, uh, you know, the production team, like Marshall and Ted, uh, tell us about the money we can't spend. Josh tells us about the rules we can't write. Mm -hmm. Yep. Say no, no, no. So impressive, <laughs> this, this place. Uh, Patrick's fine. He's actually just on the other side of this wall, right behind the camera. Uh, he is working on his design. And, I, you know, basically we flipped a coin. Like either I was going to lose my spot to Josh or he was going to lose his. So he's, Patrick's doing great. Uh, we've been working on his game, uh, playing it. It's been pretty exciting this week. And uh, he, I'm sure he'll be around in the comment section for at least, for at least some. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a little, a little ding from Patrick, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> Josh, do you remember when I asked if Smash was adjacent for his own eyes? Spike? I do remember that, yes. So, you know, there are certain rules questions that are memorable. Um, Smash was definitely one of them. I also remember getting into a little debate about temporally dynamic logic in Vast TMM, which, you know, you always love to go down to the level of philosophy of being when it comes to rules questions. I feel like TMM generated the most interesting rules question. <laughs> it, might, it might might never be topped. Um, so we usually kick things off by just talking about what we've been playing. Uh, we both got back uh, from a long studio closure. The studio is oftentimes closed uh, for the holidays, sort of like around mid to late December till the new year. And that no, uh, it was... It was like that again this year. There was no reason not to do it. Uh, and we just, you know, what have you been playing, Josh? Brian Baru. Brian I've been Baru. playing a good amount of Brian Baru. I unfortunately Ooh. actually got the rules wrong like the first couple times that I played. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I want to have a comparison about the rules. Uh -huh. So I'll go first. Sure. We, we screwed up setup so bad. Mm -hmm. We did not start with the correct amount of victory points. And we did not start with pieces on the board. Mm. But, and so I was like, boy, the first act of this game just seems slow. And also I had this weird optimum strategy around not scoring any points because I yep. thought you didn't start with any. We also messed up setup pretty bad. Uh, what we did was uh, there's a part of setup where you uh, you set the number of marriages. So like this is a game about like marry you're you're, yeah. you're an Irish you know noble and you're like trying to unite Ireland and so you're marrying people a lot and uh, it instructs you based on player count to remove a certain number of people you can marry. And rather than whittling it down to like three or four cards, we only removed like three or four cards. So we, the game went forever, we, basically. We very nearly made that mistake. Yep. We got like three rounds in, and I'm like, I think this game's over, but uh -huh. there's a lot of rounds <laughs> left. Exactly. Um, it is, uh, I think it has a cursed rule book. I like the game a lot. Me too, it has a yeah, I love book. this game. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it, to me, it's like, I think there's some weird formatting things about it. And also, like, I want it to be half the physical size. It's like yeah. classic. I mean, I, I always, yeah, the big square rule books, it's like, what do I do once it's open? It mm. takes up your entire, you know, your entire wingspan. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really interesting game. I, um, it, I, I think it doesn't, like, unseat Taj Mahal for me, but I think it's a very good entry into, like, that kind of bidding. Have you played it with, like, different player counts? Because it feels like a game that would be quite... We've only played it at three. Have you played it at, like, higher oh, counts? Oh, I've only yeah. played it with four. Yeah. 
That's it, interesting. Yeah. It's, and, and, and the board has always been like a little empty. Mm -hmm. I think yep. it's a little, so here's my one, so I love Pierre's work, love it. Um, and my only like, and this is the gentlest criticism, I'm like, it's just too friendly. I want like I want the meaner. You think Brian Burr is too friendly? I think it's way too friendly. Mm -hmm. I think it like everything just cashes out too cleanly. Mm -hmm. Like oh don't don't worry you didn't win this we'll give you a few coins. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it colored some folks in the office because we played it around the same time as we were playing a lot of Taj Mahal, which is not friendly. And it was yeah. it was just a stark a stark thing. I actually if you like Brian Brew, you should check out Polynesia, which is his mm -hmm. other game that came out recently mm -hmm. that I think is also really interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting when when I was talking with. Uh, Nick about Brian Barrier, I thought that it might just be like the meanness thing might just be a matter of learning the game because I, 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 I have had experiences in that game where like somebody has put me in a position to just fall on my own sword and then just keep like you know <laughs> progressively <laughs> going down on the sword even more so I do feel like there is space in that game to be very mean but it's kind of a subtler more roundabout sort of meanness where you're realizing like oh no yeah. Oh no! Yeah. This person has really just you know put me in a corner. So. And it, and then we'll, we will t probably be talking about arcs a fair bit in this in this designer chat. And I will say, it was so interesting to play that game after working on arcs because it, I feel like it was as if someone had given Pierre and I a writing prompt a year ago that was like make a trick tracking strategy game. And then mm -hmm. we just at each juncture chose the opposite path. Yeah. Because so the games have some similarities, but they are just super 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 different. Um, cool. I am. Let's see. What I played a lot of Radlands over the break, uh, which I, you know, Radlands mm -hmm. is rad, is good. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, we, we have, we have a yeah. bunch of copies in the office, so we should just play. It was. This is like, uh, you know, so, it's so, so funny. People ask, like, do you get jaded in the industry if like you don't buy games anymore? And I will tell you, someone brought in Radlands. We played it. And then, like, I went and bought a copy. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the next week, we were playing more Redlands, like, someone else went. Yep. In the way, like, that would happen in a normal game group. Yep. But we, we just all really, we all just really liked it. It's, it, it is, I think the Red Radlands might be the best single deck dueling game mm -hmm. I've ever played. Mm -hmm. Like, if you just like, you know, we have a single deck, we're not going to be doing, like, a, you know, but if you want, like, a magic-style duel. Sure. I think yep. it's really compact, really cool. What's, like, design. the play time? Was it, like? Like, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Well, yeah. And uh, really cool art, art, really good art direction. Mm -hmm. I think it's the best thing Mandy Strong. Um, just uh, the whole, the whole package kind of comes together. Um, and then I'm excited because maybe, yeah, I'm excited. Maybe, about this too. <laughs> maybe Josh and I and Clay. I don't know if you're watching, but this is our invitation. <laughs> I just got this in the mail, and we might play it this weekend while Josh is here. Uh, this is Conquest and Consequence. The follow-up to Triumph and Tragedy by I Craig Vesink, and the, yeah. I also love Triumph and Tragedy. And it just got here, and it's very heavy, and it's just, I love, uh, you know, cracking a big meaty GMT game. Uh, yeah, I, I really love the, the kinds of war games that really explicitly forefront the political. It's like when I first played, you know, even though I have some, some other issues with it, when I first played For, for the People... I was just like, oh yeah, no, you can really, like, there's so much space here to, you know, explore the, the like, be, poly, war is always political, right? right. So. Well, and, and I, my favorite thing about Triumph and Tragedy, mm -hmm. and I assume this is going to be the same for the sequel, is that it, it has, it, to me it makes a fundamentally correct assumption about the history of the early 20th century, which is usually when people do World War II games, they think about World War II as like, Valhalla. It's like a legendary struggle. So, you know, when you're playing a World War II game, you're always asking these questions like, oh, when does D-Day happen? Mm -hmm. When does, like, you know, Barbarossa happen? Like, what, you know, when are we going to, like, hit For our sure. marks? As if we're reenact... This is like uh, like Kabuki Theater or something. Right. And we have to, like, we're going to go through these, like, mm -hmm. the, these modes and motions. And Triumph and Tragedy says, what if you understood World War II as like a bananas roller skate accident <laughs> that no one knew what they were getting involved with and it just kept escalating right so like, like what, what are what are the nascent factions that are forming here like how do they interrelate you know what 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 is the reason why a specific country should because like world war ii was a a, a great worldwide factional yeah. Con conflict that formed dynamically over time, right? I right. mean, that's that's yeah. like what Triumph and Tragedy is say saying is in the in the first like third of, quarter to third of the game, a lot of the gameplay is kind of seeing where the cards fall, both well, metaphorically and literally, in terms of how different countries and, align. And, and you so. know, if you've ever had to teach it, 
to, to, to students, they'll always ask questions like, oh, well, why didn't they just go kill Hitler, like, right away? And it's mm-hmm. like, well, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. And, and Triumph and Tragedy kind of gets at that, like, knowing when the, like, what the war even is, when right. it's going to break out. That's part of the question of the game. It starts in 1933. The world, the world war could begin right then, mm-hmm. or it could even not happen. Yeah, and it I, could never ever happen. And I yeah. love the, I just, I love the idea that 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 he, he had he had the, the gumption to make a World War Two game where <laughs> World War Two just may not happen, uh, and and the, it, it will explain itself. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very excited to play it. Yeah, me too. Uh, I really like, I really like the designer's work. Um, but yeah, I hope you all got up to some good things. I also been playing a lot of uh, Bravely Default Two, mm. the JRPG. Cool. It's great. And inscription, and inscription, mm-hmm. of course, yep. uh, which I didn't, I didn't play, but I've watched almost all of it now mm-hmm. because uh, there were other people in my circle who were playing it, and I was just enjoying watching them so much. Yeah. And then they played through the entire thing, and I was like, "Well, this is kind of wonderful," mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't feel. The yeah, I, I, I think that you would get the vast majority. Like, you know, if if you don't want to play it, watching it will get you most of the way there. It's all about the twists and turns of, mm-hmm. of the game. So. Yeah, I mean, the core gameplay is really good, yeah. but the twists and turns really elevate it. So, well, and I, I did something. Fun. I know that you've played Disco Elysium too. Yeah, where uh, I had some friends who got into it, and I haven't played. I'm waiting to get it on Switch before I play through it with voice acting. Because I only played through it sure. before voice acting. Yeah, and, and I've heard the, vo- the voicing is really good. Mm-hmm. But uh, I found Disco Elysium was surprisingly fun to like play as a couch co-op, mm. like just to, like to like almost yep. watch like a movie. And so yeah, yeah. there there was an evening where we all got together and we just you know we were gonna play Counter Strike or something. But we ended up yeah. just watching someone play Disco Elysium. It's a it's a funny one. Yeah, it's it can be really fun to watch. Um, what I might not recommend is trying to do like a multiplayer like decide what you're going to do sort of game because man, you can get some real. I mean, it's exploring mm. political philosophy. Um, in great depth, and I've I've had an experience where two people in the same room just like got into almost like a fight over what right. what it, thing to select on um, because it 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 goes that deep in terms of like real felt political situation the, the idea of like political philosophy getting exhausted and it's really it's very good about the way the, the, the branching happens in that game where it's clear like there are actions and consequences mm-hmm. but you can't really map like a, an optimized I'm sure you can mm-hmm. but if you're playing if you're inhabiting the moment you can't really do it and that reminded me weirdly of playing King of Dragon Pet Pass which, mm-hmm. we, which we used to play as a couch co-op and we would get into spirited arguments because it's like I don't yeah. know if we've taken the refugees they've got this baggage right. we have to sort right. through all this stuff yeah, um, yeah so anyway I am uh, I, I think it was good a good break for games um, yep. I think it's been interesting in the studio over the past six months or something we started playing a lot more games in studio, which sounds like a thing that we should always be doing. But it, there are really like hot and cold times where like we'll go a year and like nobody has played a non-studio project in the office, mm-hmm. and then suddenly, you know, we're blasting through the Undaunted scenarios. Yeah. Or, you know, Radlands is out on the table, or like you know, lately Marshall and Ted have been playing a lot of Go. So like every lunch, there's like every game of Go going, and it's just a, it's wonderful to sort of like see that cycle naturally happen and then sort of remind yourself like oh yeah this is why we spent all this time Mm -hmm. making these games and uh uh, nev uh i did play babel royale um it's basically imagine if you take uh fortnite and scrabble okay and you smash them together and so you start with a word that's like falling from the sky Mm -hmm. and you land somewhere and you're basically building out words and whenever you link your word your active word with someone else's word you kill them and so it's just wild. When I saw it, I was like, whoa, so somebody has actually <laughs> did some really neat genre blending here. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, so all of the letters you've played are liabilities? Like they're all places where you can be attacked? Yes. The longer your word, the long, the more liabilities that you have, but you, as in Scrabble, you gain benefits for playing longer words. So you're getting like current uh, currency, basically, um, for, for, for playing longer words. And there are other reasons why in terms of like, if you need to get to a certain part of the map, you might need to play a longer world to get there. So it's, when, it's a neat, neat little. When I was in graduate school, I had many friends who were in comparative literature who like spoke a bunch of languages and 
uh, we I was so bad at boggle with them. Mm-hmm. So like they would just ruin. They, I, yeah. I would just get slammed against the wall. Sure, sure. I like had the moment where I'm like, do I just like start studying to uh-huh. like, improve my Scrabble game? And I was like, ah, maybe word games just aren't. That I mean, that's ultimately the problem that I have with Babel Royale is it suffers from the Scrabble problem, which is when you get like close to other players, a lot of the time, like the two and three, like you basically just have to memorize like what all the two and three letter words uh-huh. are. Because there's just so many of this. there are so many of them, and it's important just to be like, oh, there's a word that I would never use in like daily use, but right. happens to be these two letters that are next, you know. <laughs> yeah, I respect that out of good Scrabble players. It's a cool game. I'm just yep. not good at it. Uh, okay, cool. So a little studio update. Um, it's the new year, 2022. Uh, we crossed a kind of wild studio milestone, which I'm so excited about, which I, can, I guess I can announce. It's not much to announce, so, uh, because I don't know how much it'll matter to y'all. Uh, but we are done with everything that will come out this year. It's never happened. That, 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 it just It's ever timed out in such a way. Uh, but we have, you know, a bunch of the Root Marauder stuff, which is we're cur- trying to get it to you as soon as possible. We'll probably be posting a Kickstarter update about the shipping status of Root, all good news. Um, but I'll let the I'll let the, the Kickstarter update and the operations team tell you the good news. Uh, but Root Marauder is is sort of chugging along. That will be delivering to backers, and then we'll have a retail release, which is going to be a big retail release that will take up a lot of like our year's marketing bandwidth. Um, and then we'll have you know the the Arcs Kickstarter or the Arcs crowdfunding campaign, and then we'll have um, the release of Ahoy. Uh, which is done. It's at the factory, basically. There are some small things that are being finished, uh, and that will, and then we'll have probably a, another crowdfunding campaign after that for for another title. But everything that w- can be bought or played in final form that will be coming out this year is done. Uh, and so we have like you know, a, not slack in the schedule exactly, but we have a little bit of a moment to catch our breath and to make some strategic decisions about the games that we work on. Uh, and it's kind of cool, you know. It took. I think one way to think about this is this is the fruit of like three or four years of like work and staffing up and having the the team grow and everything. And it's a a really cool place to be. Um, Yeah, so we're we're not really at at the point where like we can say, oh, we know what we're doing in three years or anything like that. But everything that we're working on this year will be coming out in 2023, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. Ahoy is like, Ahoy's done. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, like, I, I, I want to highlight Patty, our graphic designer and pre-press person, just working, she basically, at this point, she's working with the manufacturer, making sure all the files are, you know, to spec and beautiful, and, uh, you know, we're we're pretty much there. Yeah, we so. are, like, finalizing box design, finalizing price point, getting all the factory stuff coordinated, but it's, it's done. Um, yeah. And it, it is built like Fort... It's a bigger game than Fort, but it's built like Fort in the sense that we are doing this outside of our usual crowdfunding model. Uh, we've been really happy with how it went. And we also um, we needed some testers for the final wave of feedback, and we put out a call. Got a really good response over the holidays. A lot of people came came into the testing Discord and, and played Ahoy and had a good time of it. So I'm just really happy with how, with how well that, that game yeah, went. Yeah, likewise. Uh, if Ahoy, oh, this is a great question from Zalister92. Uh, if Ahoy is finished, why well, haven't seen much about it yet? Well, it, because, um, you know, Kickstarter games basically have two marketing campaigns. They have the marketing campaign before the Kickstarter campaign, and then they have the marketing campaign for the retail release. So Root Marauder already had its first marketing campaign. It will have another marketing campaign as we gear up for the retail release later this year. Uh, a game that we designed to be released directly will just get one marketing campaign. And so, you know, we could start marketing Ahoy now, but we don't really have anything to sell or show. So we're going to kind of save that marketing campaign for closer to when we actually ship the game and start getting into stores and things like that. So that's why you haven't heard too much about it. We will have designer diaries and we'll have pictures to show and all that stuff. Yep. Uh, in terms of it, uh, the anticipated release, we're not sure. Uh, late summer or early fall. Is, is our guess of when of when we'll have it. It could be a little earlier, it could be a little later. It's hard to predict these things. Yep, the, the world is uh, wacky for shipping right now, so. It's just really yep. hard to know how anything's gonna take. And it isn't to say that like everything is delayed. Sometimes things happen very fast, uh, but I don't know. Yep. Um, it does appear, you know, fingers crossed, it does appear like some of the logistical tightness that uh, characterized a lot of the fall and summer seems to be loosening up a little bit. We'll, we'll see if that if that holds as a trend, though. 
Yeah, so Arizot says, I don't even really know what kind of game it is. We can talk like a little. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Ahoy summer, is, yeah. Um, Ahoy is an asymmetric strategy game. Stop me if you've heard that before. Um, it is different. It's quite different from Root, though. It, um, in the game, two players play kind of oppositional governments. There's an insurgent government and, a, and an established government. They're fighting each other. And then you have other players who are playing smugglers, which their actions are changing the topology, the land, the value of the map that is being fought over. Yeah. So, you know, you think about in Vast, there's one player who's the cave. In this game, there are, like, a few players, a couple players who are the map, who, yep. are, who yeah. are informing it. M mod modifying, uh, modifying the map as you go and changing the incentives for the other factions. Yeah, and it, um, you know, when it comes to the skinny, it's like a two-to-four game. Two-to-four player game takes an hour -ish. Once you've, I think the first game you play will take about two. Okay, sure. And then, and then the a game after that, like, we, we playing two players... You might even get down to forty-five if you've played a lot, but yeah, I'd say an hour, maybe a little bit more, more than yeah. an hour. Yeah, it is a lot. So like, where it's different, it's so interesting because I think uh, there are ways of talking about Ahoy that make it sound a lot like Root, mm -hmm. but the game is very, very different from Root. Like, yes. it shares basically nothing. No, no mechanism is certainly shared. Uh, it, but it has kind of it has a studio ethos in it for sure. And w what I'll tell folks, or you know, again, we haven't started the marketing campaign, so we don't have like talking points or anything. We're just kind of we're still figuring that out. The way I tend to think about it is, Root is fundamentally like super modular, and it's got you know a, a very very different asymmetrical positions. You can spend a lot of time just playing one faction, really sinking your teeth into it. And uh, but 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 there's a cost of admission. It's a harder game to learn. Ahoy is a game, if you have a group of players that you have a hard time getting to play Root, Ahoy is, like, directly for you. Absolutely. Um, where, like, you kind of want to play something like Root, but you don't want to get fully into that world, Ahoy is a, a, good, a good title to explore. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see. And, you know, obviously we're going to be working on these these terms. Um, so, uh, yeah, you won't be able to say anything about it on BGG. I would say we'll probably start sharing stuff about Ahoy in the late spring, early summer. Um, which is it's exciting. I mean, this is, again, like... I think if, if we were, you know, if we were at FFG headquarters right now, uh, we would not be talking about this game. Mm -hmm. but because we're still like a spunky little studio, I don't mind telling you about what we got coming down the pipe. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so that, so we got Ahoy. Ahoy is all wrapped up. Uh, the Marauder stuff's going really well. And then, you know, I'm working on ARCs, and Patrick is working on uh, Dungeon Fortress. Sometimes we're calling it Dark. We're still figuring out the name. Uh, and then Nick, who led Ahoy, is now like free. Three. He came into my office asking me what he should work on today, and I was like, "You, I was like, learn, take a break, learn, like, learn anything, something, watch yeah. a GDC yep. talk." Uh -huh. I actually, Josh sent me this GDC talk uh, about DevOps, and I liked it so much I bought both books that were referenced. Yep, Stre I, if you look it up, it's like Stress Free DevOps. I think DevOps, is the name of the, the which video. I straight love. I thought it was one of the best GDC talks I've ever I've ever watched, and so I bought the books. Um, are you uh, submitting any talks for conventions for later this year I, or next year or anything like I, that? Or? So I skipped GDC. I was yeah. lazy. I feel like a little. Um, I feel a little bad about it because I had a GDC talk I was going to give. The year went remote, and then everything was so stressful. And yeah. I was so worried about Oath. I was like, I'm just not going to give this talk. And mm -hmm. I'm just, I wrote the talk. Um, I am speaking at. Uh, I think it's going to. I'm only mentioning because I think they're going to stream it later. I'm speaking at an architectural summit. Neat. The Lake Superior Design Summit, I think is what it's what? called, about game design. They want Neat. apparently okay. they have a day where they get people who do design in non-architectural fields to mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. So I've got a talk for that, and I think I might be doing a talk at Dice Tower West. I don't know for sure. Um, not doing GDC this year, although I kind of want to, but I'll, I'll wait till next year. Yeah. I think I have. I'm at the point. I feel like I have so many GDC talks. I want to. I just have been mm -hmm. building a little yep. bank of them. What about you? Um, I'm going to be submitting a talk to the Games User Research Summit in Salt Lake. Uh, this year it's going to be in Salt Lake. Um, I'm thinking about doing a talk about um, kind of like speculative ideas for rules question answering. So things like, um, you know, imagine if you had a chat bot that you could ask it a question and it would uh, go to a how to play video, look at the transcript, read it, do some some language processing and give you a deep link to the part in the video that might help you. So like ways that we can combine artificial intelligence and natural language processing, which is absolutely blowing up. Like if you haven't looked at this stuff, 
artificial intelligence and language has absolutely transformed over the last four or five years. Um, so I'd like to think about new ways to use that kind of technology to help people answer rules questions on the fly and things like that. So And well, I mean, one of the biggest um, takeaways that, okay, so this is, I'm going to foreground a longer comment. Oftentimes we don't think at the level of the publisher much about answering rules questions. It is a part of our job. It's like a tax we have to, it's, it's like replacing missing pieces. We know that when a game comes out, we're all going to have to go on the forums and Josh is often going to bear the brunt of it, and we're just going to answer a bunch of questions because that's what it means to release a game. I think Oath was the very first time that I worked on a game where we started giving some thought to the kinds of questions we were going to get and to see if we could head them off at the pass. Yeah. And I think you could probably perform a pretty deep analysis on the Root Rules Forum and the Oath Rules Forum that would show how dramatically that strategy has helped. And the strategy for Oath was the building of the card database, the centralization of the FAQ, and the saying like, you know, one of the problems with FAQs is once they reach a certain complexity level, they become like almost inaccessible right. because they're just these giant lists. Yep. And so by using the car, the components of the game as like a key or an index really, yep. it allows those questions mm -hmm. to kind of organize themselves in a, in a way that is so much richer than like any forum could. could yeah, and it's them. neat seeing people, for example, in the Woodland Warriors building like Discord bots that like build on top of that stuff, where as long as you're giving data in a uh, readily accessible format, people can just use it. Like they can create their own, mm -hmm. um, you know, implementations that help them do qu yeah. answer questions during yeah. the game. And like the, and the TTS pulls from it too. Mm -hmm. So like as long as your information is accessible, people can do tons of yeah. stuff with it. So it's really neat to see. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I really like about how th this company treats a lot of the assets we generate is we just try to get them in public places so that anybody who wants to like look at where the questions are stored can just look at them. Yep. They're like, they're not hard to find. I mean, we could probably put them on like GitHub mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Yep. They're, they're not there though, they're on our server. They're, uh, they're hosted on our website. Yeah, they're hosted on our yep. website. Right yep. uh, but you, you can get them by using the Oath Cards tool. If you just search Oath Cards in Google, yep. you'll find it. Uh, someone asked about, um, this is a great question, which is gonna lead me right into ARC's discussion. Um, why do board games uh, not often... Okay, so the, uh, this is a question that's now scrolled over, but I'll, re I'll restate it. Um, a, a user asked, why don't you see more board games use tutorials, hand-holding tutorials like video games? Um, and I think it's a great question, and the answer is some do. Like Oath has, Oath, a, yeah. Oath has a very hand-holding tutorial. Um, one problem that you run into is that Oath's tutorial is both too fast and too slow. Uh, I think, you know, there are some folks who want it to be over instantly, mm -hmm. and there are other people who would love it to, to be a two-turn tutorial or a three-turn tutorial. Yeah. I mean, if you've played, uh, like, a Paradox strategy game like the new Crusader Kings, that tutorial mode is, like, three hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yes. it's like, you will end this tutorial when you are King of Ireland. And, it, you know, it's just kind of yep. key. I'm always surprised in that tutorial because I think, I'm like, okay, now I understand all the systems. And then I play, I play you know, a half an hour or something, and suddenly it's like, oh, now you've entered yeah. the really advanced part mm -hmm. of the tutorial. Yeah. Uh, and I think, it, you know, we try to be really sensitive to the game and the audience when we're designing the, turn, the teaching systems for the game. So Oath got a very fulsome tutorial, a long playbook, and then, of course, the law. Ahoy, I mean, you want to talk about, yeah, like, the learning totally. systems in Ahoy? Yeah, I mean, so Ahoy won't have a tutorial. It's not needed. Um, basically, uh, in Ahoy, um, what what we did basically was, you know, we have our player boards. It's an asymmetric game, so you'll generally be able to just, like, look at your player board and understand what actions you can do. Um, but then also, uh, what we're going to be including is a little tiny player booklet guide, a pocket guide to Oath. To, to Ahoy, yes. I <laughs> uh, only wish I could do, have done that for, uh, for, for Oath. And basically, the concept here is in just a little tiny four four page spread. It's actually three pages with the ones the cover. You can learn basically the entire game. And so we had an entire testing track that was like, can people learn this game just with this tiny little book? And so we put a lot of time and effort into making sure that as much as possible, you're just never referencing the rule book. There will of course be edge cases that come up, but we tried to make it possible where you can, you know, jump in and people can have their little guide. They need to learn, reference how something works. We'll be right there for them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Ahoy just did not need a tutorial like uh, like Root and Oath did. 
par partially because of how asymmetric everything is in those games. With Ahoy, because it's simpler, it's not like this massively, massively asymmetric thing like Root is. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I mean, I think that also it depends on like what the budget is of the projects. Mm -hmm. when you're, like if you're asking this question as someone who's like looking into designing your own games, you know, tutorials take a lot of time. Yeah. And a bad tutorial, you're going to wish you had never done it in the first place. And so, like, look, when it came to working on, like, Premiere and John Company, I opted for slightly more verbose and conversational rule books with lots of, lots of examples because I knew that it was I was more likely going to screw up the engineering of a tutorial mm -hmm. than not. And so you, you, it just it just depends. It yeah. just depends on the... Yeah, the, I, I mean, that, that tutorial, the, just the tutorial probably was more hours than all of the other rules work. Yeah. Like, point blank. It takes a lot, a lot of work. Well, and, and I think, you know, when we go into the early stages of the projects, we're oftentimes thinking about, like, how's this going to teach? How's it going to demo? And so for ARCs, you know, one of the things I told Josh right away is I really want a full page, like, you know, imagine a U.S. letter page, like a four page, you know, booklet, really, it's just a folded sheet of paper, that is like a quick start rule book. Now, I don't know if that's actually going to be able to happen. Maybe it ends up being six pages. Maybe it's its own little booklet. Who knows? But... Because ARCs is fundamentally has like pretty simple actions, but you do need to understand all of them in their inner relation. I want I would love to say, hey, new players, here's a very short rulebook that will get you playing. Don't worry about all the other stuff the game can do. Just worry about this small little booklet. Just as a way of like chunking the information. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Ahoy's art is by Kyle. That's an easy question. Yep. <laughs> easy. Easy, easy, easy question. Um so uh, Ahoy is in the TTS until release sooner or later. Never, uh, I don't know. We'll, 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 we don't know yet. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll like figure that out. That's uh, I love I love questions like that because like I don't know marketing is going to tell us what to do, uh, yeah. and you know that's that, that's how it goes. Uh, Arcs will be coming out in 2023. So uh, you can see it a little bit. It's on the table, uh, not because I'm being a tease. It's because I didn't want to clean it up. When I was Lazy. sitting at the kitchen, yeah. <laughs> well, we had a lunch, and Pat, Patty invented the greatest party game of the 21st century, uh, and we were playing her party game. And then I thought, you know, I don't want to leave. <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't. That's how go. good it was. That's how. That's how you good heard it, it here first. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I'm just saying. <laughs> Patty's design track now. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I didn't clean up arcs, which means it's now here for us to, to talk about. Everyone's um, going to be taking screenshots and enhance, 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 uh, you can and everything. Guess, who can guess what piece here? I'm going to make it like a little stage. Who can guess what game this piece is from? There's no way. It's like a little. A little <laughs> it's slant. too small. <laughs> it's too small. Look at that. Nope, nope. You can't see an arc card. What is that from? What's this piece from? No one knows. It's from, uh, okay, you know what? This is going to be like a, like an NPR trivia game where I'm going to tell you at the end of the show. Nice. Um, no, it's not from Mario Kart. Uh, anyway, yeah, so all the ARC stuff is out, is out in a mess. One of the jobs of Josh's visit here is to get him playing this game a bunch and uh, just kind of start getting him to think about it. Um, th this design is in an interesting spot where it is very close to being system complete. There are a couple of elements that I'm not super happy with, but this game is, despite the fact that it's a white prototype, I mean, you can see how my prototypes look. I, I like saving ink when I work on prototypes, so most everything's white. Um, it is, if, if we were to dress it up, the core system is as far along as Oath was when we did the Oath Kickstarter. Yeah, the, the last time I visited in June, it was already feeling solid. So. Yeah, so it like it, you know, it just it's 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 it, it, it's changed a lot in the last four or five months, but in ways that are like every month it changes a little bit less. Now, it is not anywhere near ready to show on Kickstarter. It'll be a few months before we get it ready. And one of the biggest questions for the design. So basically, there are two things in front of it. One thing is. Uh, we have to finish the remaining systems that need to be built out. There's just a couple little things. Like, for instance, uh, there was a whole part of the game that was not engaged the last, like, game. Or really the last two games I played of this, it didn't even interact with one of the core systems. So I have to make the decision, like, do I want to just jettison that system or is it worth protecting? So that's the first thing that needs to happen. And then the second thing that needs to happen is we need to start formalizing uh, the content templating, by which I mean... How, like, what are the rules of generating content for the game? 
because currently everything is like very bespoke. It's very much like I'm drawing, making one card at a time. I'm just sort of like asking myself, like, is this card too hard? Is it too easy? There, there, you know, it's all just kind of by the gut. And there's already a lot of content for this game. Uh, I think there are uh, maybe 90 unique cards uh, just th so th that have already been designed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th that's what I mean when I was like, this game's further along than Oath was. Mm -hmm. When Oath launched, there were 60 unique cards. And this game already has more. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of those cards got redesigned anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 correct, correct, correct. <laughs> so so it's, all, it's, all, it's all cooking along. Um, what were, yeah, so uh, Ahoy will, will not be on Kickstarter, thanks, Patrick. Um, what, what I'm hoping for the schedule is I would like to have this game done, you know, by the late summer, um, and then to you all by next summer, 2023, summer of 2023. And there will be ways to play it online, you know, for folks who like uh, playing their games digitally. We'll, we'll certainly provide those things. Uh, and so, you know, if, you, if you're really excited about it and you want to participate, don't worry, we'll certainly be doing that. Um, when we start releasing those kits and winding up to the Kickstarter depends totally on the marketing schedule for the game, which has not been totally finalized yet. But, uh, I mean, I just, like, I, the first thing I did today uh, when I got to the office was I started typing out the, um, the notes for the RFQ, which is a re request for quote, which we will send to our factories to see how much this game is going to cost for them to make. And then we'll make some hard decisions about like what gets to be wood, what has to be punch board, will there be an upgrade kit, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been interesting seeing the studio go harder into just really thinking about product profile from the very beginning. Because mm -hmm. I feel like with Root, or like Vast Days or Root Days, um, it was more design um, and then somewhat later in the process product profile kind of came in mm -hmm. but for starting with oath i feel like product profile and thinking about like okay what's our box what can we actually fit in the box how do the components all like really thinking about both for you know cost standpoint but also just for usability you know i feel like the studio has really um progressed in terms of from the very beginning thinking about like okay what what can we use like what yeah yeah uh, some folks have asked, like, are we 100% sure we're going to be doing Kickstarters? We might be looking at other platforms. Uh, we're, of course, always going to be looking at a wide range of platforms. I mean, I think uh, no one at the studio, certainly not Patrick and myself, uh, has any love for cryptocurrencies. So obviously, screw them for that. But it's also not really clear what Kickstarter is deciding to do yet. And so we're kind of just waiting for the white paper. You know, I always tell folks that, like, you know, uh, I obviously am not enthusiastic about a lot of blockchain technology. Not all of it, but not a lot of it. Uh, but I do like the fact that, like, Kickstarter is unionized. So th this, is a, this is a complicated decision, and we haven't even gotten near actually making the, yeah. ma making a choice. I spent it. probably, like, a good solid week, two solid weeks after that just going, like, I need to actually really understand everything that I can about crypto and blockchains because it, the rabbit hole just goes super super deep and i feel like i almost drove myself insane I because like, there's so many things there's and, yeah. and there are lots of like interesting applications of technology and i think look right now people are right to be really suspicious yes. of nfts yep. and of anything involving the word cryptocurrency i wouldn't go so far as to assume that of like anything having to do with the blockchain which does have applications beyond that but it's super complicated and it might turn out that we have strong opinions mm -hmm. about Kickstarter's eventual direction. But basically, I'm, I'm kind of just waiting for the white paper. I just, I, I, you know, the, the my general attitude is I'm only happy taking a position against something if I know what the thing right. is that we're taking a position against. Yeah. So we're just kind of waiting right now. Um, and, you know, of course, there are going to be times like, for instance, you know, uh, well, we'll just have to evaluate it as it comes because like pivoting a big project from one platform to another does, right. take, does take time and resources. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we're, we're, we're watching it. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, I I uh, I agree with you, SP Shaman. This is like a thing. I have a friend who works in venture capital, and they're like, yeah, everyone just uses the word blockchain to make people excited, and yeah. they almost never like really mean what they're talking about. Right. And so I, you know, yeah. I don't want to mistake someone's like goofy marketing copy for like a serious policy decision. But I, you know, we'll, we'll see what the white paper yeah. says. Yeah, I, I mean, I, what ultimately, you know, as I was looking in, into this. There are tons of technical and engineering objections to blockchain for 
almost every application as far as I can tell. Like you go to a specific use case and it's like, well, we can already do that in this particular way and it doesn't actually help us in, uh, in any way. So there are certainly um, myriad objections, not just from say an environmental standpoint for, for things like proof of work, cryptocurrency, but blockchain chain generally. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm highly, highly skeptical of just about everything. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and then I will, you know, we'll, we'll just get all the controversial business stuff out in one, in one <laughs> go. Uh, Patrick Marshall is the question. Uh, we're vocal about TTS. We're waiting out there on news as well. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're doing right now in the studio, we had a long discussion about it. I mean, basically, uh, you know, as a company, we operate uh, where possible. We try to operate on consensus, and consensus is slow. So we had, a, we had a big meeting on Monday where we talked about all of our worries and what demands might look like. And if we have demands, what are, what's the best strategy for getting those demands implemented? And we're taking a few days to kind of sort throughout feelings about this. And, and I think generally this is a good thing. I mean, I will say uh, unequivocally, uh, everyone on staff is incredibly disappointed by the actions of the TTS moderator. Seems like they were acting way outside of their um, their role, and uh, and I, I would hope that they certainly apologize to Zoe. Zoe's a member of our community, uh, the person we, 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 we care about. And, uh, you know, we we understand, too, that, like, uh, there are a lot of different people who use the, our, our TTS mods. And, and actually, we don't even, some of the TTS mods that exist aren't even our own. Uh, our general policy here is that we provide assets for people to use on whatever platforms they like. Right. So one of the biggest things that we worry about is like any kind of exclusive deal. We don't want to say, hey, we, we have, we're siloing everybody to the official mod. Yeah, and like our PNPs are out there, for example, for people to pull assets from. Yeah, so. um, and you know, so I, I think w where we're at is um, we're generally happy that the global chat was taken down. Mm -hmm. we're, I, I'm happy to see uh, more unequivocal statements from Berserk Games, just about the values of the company. Uh, I'm interested in the kind of actions that they're going to take to actually put those things uh, into effect. And I, I think I also want to allow a little bit of grace because I know most of them are English second language and the company is mostly based in China and Poland, as I understand it. And I think that it can lead to some like sort of like um, I, I think it's easy to potentially misread the situation, too. So I want to give them a little bit of time to respond and to kind of sort things out. Uh, and while that's happening, we are in active conversations here about figuring out what kind of actions we want to see and the proper points to apply on the pressure. Uh, this could range everywhere from a full boycott to just taking off the links to uh, the mods, but kind of leaving up everyone's work. Um, a lot of people have worked tremendously hard on these programs, and it's not their fault that these that, 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 that this bad moderation decision was made. And so, you know, if people want to continue to support those mods, it may be that we let those those things stay up. So this is still being sorted out, but we're, we're trying to find a course of action that everyone in the company is is satisfied with. Uh, and, and that means that it's like, you know, we don't we don't get to, to, to ride, ride the fashionable wave on Twitter, but that's we, we make decisions where we can live with. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree, SP Shaman. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, no, I, I and I, you know, Cosmic Duck, I'm happy. I'm happy you brought it up, and I think, you know, we're uh, we, we just I think try as far as we can to be just thoughtful about this and and re respectful for positions that are not our own, and uh, and that you know that that kind of complexity might not be super exciting to folks, but that, that that's what we got. So, if you if you want the gray area we're in, we're here. Yep. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, let's talk about arcs a little bit. Let yeah, see. I think well, that's let's see great. what time it is. Okay, well, we've gone a little long. We're doing <laughs> really? great. We're doing great. We got it's quarter till, but we, we can go long. Um, so thoughts about the the root winter tournament? What we communicate? Yeah, so we're not we're not quite going to round up the TTS chat yet. Mm -hmm. um, what we communicated to Garrick is that we support him either way. If he wants, if he's put him and his team, they put a ton of work into the winter tournament. And if they want to go forward to it, prize support, we're, we're happy to, to help them. But if, if they think that they should pull it, we completely support him. We'll help him move to whatever platform he wants or, or whatever. Um, and so I really just want to empower the folks in our community to make the decisions that make the most sense for yeah, them. Rather than dictating. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So any BGA love? B yes, in ways that... We'll know more soon later. I don't think we can announce the BGA stuff that we're working on yet. I will say as a developer, B 
BGA is a really cool platform. As a developer, it is not possible to use because it's it's a code enforcing. It, it wouldn't mm -hmm. make it. We can't build a game on a on a uh, on a BGA mod. Yeah, uh, it's BGA not is also it, yeah. <laughs> BGA is also like part of the Asmodee family, which makes me kind of queasy. But whatever. I think that it is a fun platform. I'm happy to yep. be able to play Feast for Odin finally online. That's cool. Get the Norwegians. On yes, there, absolutely. Please. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, sorry about that, Garrick. Ugh. Um, talk about arcs. Let's or? talk about arcs. Yep. Okay, cool. I, I was just checking, yep. making mm -hmm. sure I was all all scooped. Um, okay, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that exist about arcs. Let me just talk about what you can see here, because uh, so the game obviously comes with a wireless Logitech keyboard. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive for us to put us <laughs> in the box, expensive. but we, we make a commitment um, to you right now. <laughs> and and our, our commitment to you is that everything in this box will be more sensible than a large plastic wand. Just, just saying. <laughs> no, it's not a reference to anything. <laughs> so, yeah, is that not a reference just, at just all? Um, so I'll put this over here. Um, uh, what, what you can probably see from here, and I won't, you know, I, this isn't like a big reveal stream or anything. Uh, Arc says a point to point map. There you go. It's bigger than the root map, uh, maybe. Uh, the, the, right now, it's, it's been sitting at like 18 clearings, 18 systems with some interstitial systems. So the map actually has like 25 ish points of connection, uh, which gives it a bigger, a bigger feel. Um, Do you want a space game? You know, you want Yeah, you, you want, yeah, yeah yes. And, um, it, uh, so, so I think that that's a, f a fundamental thing about it. Um, it has player boards in it. Uh, here's one. Boop -a uh, one thing I like about the player boards is that the tech system of the game works like this. Uh, these six slots are the six different kinds of things that you can build in the game. And then when you get a new tech, you put it in the slot. And that means if you like have the cool, you know, let's say you have like the, the cool battlement or whatever, and you want to change what that piece type can do, you can choose like, oh, could I use a different piece type for this? Or you can override and say, no, I don't need battlements anymore. I'm switching to like telescopes or something. Um, so that's on this side, which 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 works. Uh, you'll see the player board's pretty light. I mean, I imagine by the time it's through our usability testing, there'll be lots of text everywhere that there can be. Um, that, we'll see. <laughs> that, that's kind of how, how we roll a little bit. Um, I had a funny moment where when I was working on a John Company asset, I realized there was no text on it really. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is just a, a style thing. Where mm -hmm. there are some games where if you can't explain everything on the, the relevant component, you should just go for it. And the other times where it's like, no, look it up in the rule book here, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and I think I think di different games kind of demand different different things. So like in the example for John Company's, John Company's board has hardly any text. Mm -hmm. Like almost none. It's just tracks and numbers. And that's because there is just so much happening in the in the footprint, the physical footprint of that game, that I was I, I made an active attempt to like let's pull text off mm -hmm. and, and put it in different places. Yeah, the bal balancing that is really important because like in 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 Ahoy, um, be, like for example, you have a couple different piece classes, mm -hmm. and having some of the explanatory text on like a card that you can like pass around the table is like something that's really helpful. So like pulling it away from the big board. Yep. And pulling it onto some other component that lets you share with other players, like that's that's one sort of trade off that you have to think about of where you're putting the text. Ahoy so. is like a straight up masterclass in this. Like where it puts the text is so smart because I can I can see a reaction to root and finding ways to be a little bit terse mm -hmm. with the language. The game's also a little bit simpler, and so it really like it holds your hand at like all the right times. Yeah. Uh, and then once you know the game, you don't you don't even look at it. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and TMM too is a little bit of a reaction mm -hmm. to to. Crystal Caverns in terms of things like the skeletons where it's like, okay, another player wants to know what that skeleton does, so it's not something that's on the board anymore. It's actually its own card that you can pass around. So thinking about the table dynamics is always something that's important to do when you're thinking about rules text. Who's going to be looking at what, when, basically. So so Arcs has a central board. It is, uh, you know, Roots board is a square. Arcs is, is a, is a six-panel rectangle. Uh, that's important because uh, and the, even though the player boards are, a root player board would go down about here, and so these player boards are a little skinnier. Uh, that's nice because it just makes the table space a little bit more intimate. Yep. Uh, it's also important because there is other stuff that has to be out there. Um, you know, we have these like banks of resources. I can't pick up this little board right here, but like uh, just because it's covered with stuff. Um, 
there's, there's like a game status board that you use for like round tracking and things like that. Um, the, you know, for folks, I guess I'm being a little scattered here. What I'll say about arcs generally, so I'm going to say a couple things. Uh, one, in complexity. So arcs, the, the big view about arcs in my mind is I, I have, it's definitely a reaction to Oath, um, but it makes different bets. So it's not Oath 2. It's, it's like this is like Oath's twin. Like it was like, if you go back to the moment of birth and say like, what about a different way of doing this? And so the different ways d does things like the following. Uh, this game ends, arcs, an arc is three games long, basically, two, two to three acts long. Um, you need the same set of players for the full sequence. Every uh, game of arcs takes about an hour, a little bit less sometimes, uh, sometimes a little bit more. And if you play three in a row, you get one three hour game but there's also a system for saving your progress. So if you want to play, you know, the first two episodes, save your game, and then do the second, ep the third episode the next week, that's totally fine. Uh, this is a direct, direct reaction to the fact that I love Twilight Imperium and I don't have time to play it. <laughs> and so, like, it just sort of slices the game up. But this, well, here's what I mean about placing bets in different places. Because there is continuity of player position. If I'm at the very end of my session of arcs and I don't know what to do with my last turn, I could build a big army because next game, like literally when we start the next game, I have the big army. The, the board position ports exactly from one game to another. Um, so that's useful. And the fact that the game ends allows the game to be a lot more dramatic, whereas Oath is gradualistic and generational, arcs is dramatic. And so like, you know, a lot of Oaths, like a lot of my reading for Oath was history, I read like a lot of Brodell. A lot of Arx's reading is like James Brooks's stuff on plot and like really thinking about narrative structure. Um, so that's that's kind of like the big picture in terms of system complexity. I don't know, like is he? I mean, easier I, I, than yeah. Root. Yes, I yes. think certainly mm -hmm. easier than Root. What? But one of the ideas is imagine you start with a game that is easier than Root. Like, it's more complicated than Ahoy, but not much more. Yeah. But then by the end of the third game, you might be, like, close to, like, Mysterious Manor. Right, and that part, of, part of that is the modularity of the player positions, right? You know, you're starting with a board that's, you know, this, and yeah, then and as you go, you know. Yeah, you're, you're going to be putting yep. different, different things. Um, the, you know, w one of the things that I also learned um, from just what... And actually, this is something I really learned from the Arkham Horror card game. Um, you can... Do I think board games have this problem with flow where, you know, we're playing a game, we're in good flow, uh, but then if something dramatic or interesting happens, the flow shuts down. And so what, what I realized in Arkham is that the way the scenarios get broken up, they, they say like all that really disruptive stuff in the flow, what if we put it in those, those break points? Mm -hmm. Because then we can allow the game to really take wild pivots without messing with the core flow of the design. I was very interested when I played the End of the Earth campaign, or I played the, the first part of it, and they have a new checkpoint system, which does exactly mm, the kind of the same okay. thing this game does, where it's like, hey, you got to the end, do you want to stop? Make some choices, here's some big changes that are going to happen, and then here's the second part of that same scenario. Right. But they actually build it so that you could pack things up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't. Uh, Brodell is B R A D U E L. Um, Ferdinand Brodell. The Mediterranean is the book you should read. But civilization and capitalism is also good. And the thing that really struck me playing it today, which, you know, I haven't played it in, uh, in almost six months now, was just how snappy it was. Like, this, it feels, you know. Jets and you know, r root and and oath. You know, you can have some pretty long and involved turns here. You can just, you can just snap them out. It's pretty. It, it, it feel it feels different. So there is like I don't want to get too in my own head about it, yep. but one way I think about it is um, I have this like this is so okay. I've been running a lot lately. Sometimes I forget my headphones, which is dangerous because it means I'm going to think about whatever. For, uh, think for, about the fact that you're running and your and heart just, is beating. And I'm and, just like yeah. thinking. And my mind wandered like a few weeks ago. Uh, my mind wandered to the weirdest place, which is I was thinking about narrative structure and root and how in r the Redwall books, the narrative is a lot like a modern fantasy, which is it, it hands off very cleanly, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, we're going to give Martin a chapter and then we're going to give Marielle a chapter or whatever. And we're going to go back and forth and back and mm -hmm. forth and back and forth. And you can almost map out 
exactly who gets which chapter. It's like a it's like a little narrative baton, and that's how Root works. It's like every turn is about the same length, and you kind of pass them along. Mm-hmm. And Oath has these big blocky turns, and it's a lot like older fashion, uh, older fantasy, like the Perdane books or Tolkien, where you've got like no, no, no the first half of the two towers has nothing to do with Frodo, mm-hmm. and it's like you're going to be hanging out with these people for two hundred pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Oath has these long terms that really lets players like, you know, kind of stretch out and like tell these little stories. And I think that's it, it's a weird thing because when people tell me like Oath plays slow or there's too much downtime, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, there is a lot of downtime. It is it is buying something because mm-hmm. it's buying this kind of narrative coherency. This game I think is the most cinematic in the sense that it's like you get a little like rat a tat fast little turns and then like whoop some long turns mm-hmm. come in there and you get you can have back to back turns it's v- it's very very fluid uh turn order yep um, and it's like a totally core core part part of the game yeah and it was in with oath i remember that this was actually a critical question at one point in the development of um, you were tinkering with a an impulse system that broke up those really long mm-hmm. um, those those really long turns into something that was smaller. But ultimately, you decided that it was just like it was ruining sort of the storybook, you know, for yeah. the progression of the full turn that you were talking about before. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's like this is like a this is like a, des- a design aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is yep. like something that, that you can play. Play with. And I think that this is a really important part of I think how we build games at the studio. This is true of Patrick and everybody at studio. Um, there isn't really like a, a right or wrong way to design any system. There are just different choices that you make about how you want a system to present itself, and then you can try to cash it for different kinds of yep. payouts. What, right? What's the feeling you're going for? Right. You know, yeah, this the feeling fun. audience, yep. and this is why, like you know, I think sometimes because we all love our jobs. Generally, I don't want to speak for anyone else here, but I love my job. Um, it's easy to think like, oh, we were just making like, you know, the things we always dreamed we'd make. And it's like, no, we are like really, I think we, as a studio, we try to be very sensitive to like, what is the design moment we're living to and responding to? We feel like uh, we get to participate in this really cool conversation where every utterance in that conversation is like a published game. Yep. And we try to be very responsive to that conversation and responsive to our audience and then of course our own desires for what we want to play and as long as we're being true to those three sort of like axes i think you know the the, the games will, will will come out and do well so anyway that's a long uh, you know what we we're really talking about was this is a player board um <laughs> But yeah, so Oath has a card-driven action system. You're going to play a number of hands. The game's going a little short right now. Like we've been playing a lot of like three-hand games. I think it's going to be like four or five probably. Eventually, uh, you're going to have a hand of actions. Boop, here they are. Um, and the way it works, so this is a critical thing that someone's going to get mad about, but whatever. Um, this is like an old-school card game in that you're going to get a set. You're going to get a hand, and it could be a bad hand. Like, you could get dealt, like, a really garbage hand, and there's no, like, hand draft. No, no. It's mm-hmm. like, no, you got dealt a bad hand. Uh, there are a, a couple small places for drafting your hand a little bit, but generally the possibility of bad hand is really important. And then the core mechanism is really simple, which is, you know, one player is going to lead a card. Bloop, let's say it was this card, which uh, determines the active suit, and they're, they're going to take actions equal to the icons on the card. And then other players can follow with any card in their hand, bloop, onto the, the, the cards. And when they follow, after they play the card, they immediately take the action. Now, the highest, if you f- uh, follow with a card that's on suit but higher, you get to use your full card. If you follow with an, uh, with an on suit card that's lower, uh, you, you only get to use one of the actions. Um, and then whoever plays the highest uh, card of the suit gets to take the initiative and lead the next uh, card. Now. One thing that makes the whole system work is that let's say you really want to build, oh, you're so happy it's time for construction, but you don't have any construction cards. You can play any card. You can play this battle card, for instance. And when you play this battle card, you're playing it off, and you have two options. You can play it for one icon. So even if this had several icons, you could just play it for a single battle. You're like, look, I know everyone's building. I really need to fight. We're going to fight. Or you can play this off, and we usually play them face down, and you can play it as if it were one icon of the lead suit. A copy. Yeah, you can like copy, which means when I'm looking at my bad hand, I'm like, well, I really wanted to build. I can start asking myself questions of like, well, these, I don't have any build cards in my hand. I'm gonna turn my move cards into build cards, and I'm gonna do that, but I have to wait for somebody to lead build. Yeah. Uh, and everybody needs to do everything all the time. So, the, but but you you've lost control of the, of the tempo, and so much of this game is about tempo mm-hmm. control. And one thing that I love about this 
particular trick-taking design is that in some designs I find it difficult to keep track of like if the if the numbers on a given suit go up to like a million it just becomes very difficult to like think about like okay what does that player have what does that player have here it's just what zero to four yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the, the card counting scheme is like where's the four right like, exactly so very... so so it's not like this super super brain burn it like it doesn't slow play down it feels like the appropriate level of okay i can make some reasonable guesses about you know once i've seen this number come out that i can i can plan it's a trick taking game where you can really plan so. and you, you can always throw away two cards to just force take the initiative which sometimes you're like look my hand's junk but i really need to make these moves and i have a low movement number card so I'm just gonna blow through two of my actions, take the initiative, and now I'm in a spot where I can where I can take the move. You know, one of the one of, one of my thinkings about this design is, if I think about Pamir and Oath and Root, all of them are so action tight. They're just oh, your kingdom for one more supply point in Oath, or one more action in Pamir. And one of the fundamental things I wanted to try to fix with this game is what happens when I like flood the players with actions. Like every turn you get a hand and your hand might be good for like 20 actions or like five, depending on how it's played, depending on which things you want to get done at which times. And, and because you're getting a hand, like the hand is free. You just get it every, every new hand, you get a new hand. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of like just actions to burn. And it, it's such a fun place to explore because you just, you don't, you know, it doesn't have quite the same tightness. Mm -hmm. It has a different kind of tightness because it, it, uh, that, that's more positional. Um, but I've, I've really liked how the action system's gone. It, I'm actually getting ready to make a very small revision to which cards have which actions, but that's the only adjustment that has happened in the literally last six weeks on the action yeah. system. People so are just asking very, about, uh, are the cards dealt out? Yeah, yeah. So you, you get, you, like, it's like a trick taker. In the three-player version of the game, you get a hand of six. You're playing every single card. And then mm -hmm. we, we do a little cleanup step, and then you get a new hand of six. Yeah. And we there are like a couple cards that are like burned out, so you don't have like perfect information, right? Correct. Or, yep. Yeah, yeah. There's always gonna be a couple cards. And someone asked about the play count. Uh, this is a three or four player game. I can see a world where it might be okay with five, but that I am like primarily designing it as three or four. And if there is not a super 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 compelling reason for there to be five, we will not do five for the initial product profile and if you're sad about your group with six play two tables i mean like you yeah. know the joy of the three-player game um the vast majority of the testing almost all the testing has been done with three players i don't know there's no reason to think that four would be uh that that troublesome I, i'm hoping to get some four player games in later this week uh, the main reason why we haven't been playing with four is because it just every player adds a lot of content and not all the content has been designed yet um yeah I'm I'm Garrick. I love strict player counts too, uh, especially after John Company's one to six player <laughs> account, <laughs> which I I will defend that player count for that game because I do like it at all those counts. But I'm I'm good. Uh, okay, so uh, you know just a couple little like things that are different from other games we've worked on. Uh, the map looks like root. Like you're gonna have some pieces. They might be wood. You'll have other pieces which are flat pieces like punch board that go on the map. They take up slots. This all sounds familiar. Biggest difference. Everything takes a hit. Everything. You know, you want to damage a ship, you, you, you knock it on its side. You damage a building, you, you knock it on its side. It has a damage side. This is really important because the game has this, like, really uh, dynamic tempo. So if, if you get ruined in a battle and all your stuff's damaged, you might be able to then say, I'm going to seize initiative and use a movement card to get out. Yep. Yeah, it feels really neat to just have a, a small board presence. Like in the game that we played this afternoon, I didn't have like a lot of systems. I had these two little forces and I was kind of going in, hitting, getting out, and then repairing. And like if you manage your um, initiative correctly, other people won't be able to get back at you by the time that your force is kind of back at strength. Like a little group of ships, like two ships that have smart use of the repair cards can do so much damage. Mm -hmm. They can do so well. And I mean, and a single ship won't be able to do much, but when you have a battle card, you know, one of the things I like about this game is like you have, the, the battle system is very, very fast. I'll mm -hmm. talk about it in a second. And if you have a battle card that's like, hey, do three battles. Well, you're one ship, like you can only do max hits what per the number of units, just like Root. And you might say, okay, well, this one ship, if it gets in three or four battles right now, it can actually do some damage despite the fact that it's one ship. And if I manage my initiative correctly, I can move in, raid, and then get out. And yeah. so, you know, whereas Root has ambush cards and this 
ambushing is like built into the texture mm-hmm. of the action system yeah. where you can be like, oh, I, I had the wrong cards. You kind of caught me in the good spot. You, you you pinned me. And you didn't have to play an ambush card to, to get it. Yeah, the, the battle system is just also super snappy. It's simpler than Root, I feel like. Yeah. It's so just, I, I don't even mind showing yeah. it. It hasn't changed in a long time. Here's the battle system, everyone. Take a screenshot of that. Um, it uh, is very, very straightforward. Basically, every attacking ship gets one die. And the attacker chooses from three different types of dice. And those three different types of dice are different strategic paradigms. So they can bombard, they can assault, and they can raid. And the way the paradigms work is bombarding is you only have a third chance of strike of t- doing a hit, but you have no liability. And assaulting is you have a chance of doing a hit, you have a chance of an exchange where both parties are going to be hit, and you have a chance that nothing happens. And then raiding is there's a much higher chance that you're going to be hit, but if you succeed, you might be able to steal some stuff from, the, from your opponent. And so if you have four ships, you could be like, well, I'm going to do one bombard and two assaults and one raid just in case I get lucky. And then you roll those dice and they're, it instantly resolves. Um, yep. And so it, it has just a very, like, it, you know, o- Oath's battle system was, it was and is complex because there are a lot of different inputs in a lot of situations. This, uh, the fundamental thing that this combat system had to do was be fast. And uh, so it's very, very flexible, very easy. Uh, you know, you, you, you can play in, in a hand of cards. There might be like as many as eight battles and the battles are just almost instant. Uh, as, and like the, the way that the hits get allocated is like very, very um, simple. It's like it's almost um, it's almost on rails. Like hits have to be allocated in a very logical way, which is like the stuff fighting gets hit and destroyed mm-hmm. first. Then the building. Yeah, we, we, we joked about how it's going to be. It's like it's it's root. But two things take two hits rather than one. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, is each session one hand of cards? Someone asked. No, each session is probably going to be like three to five hands of cards, um, and, and that that tends to take about forty five minutes to an hour. Um, there is an open question about whether or not we will provide a single session mode in the game. Where if you want to like learn the game but you don't want to engage the like full campaign system, is there a way to play like the ninety minute version of the game? Maybe. Uh, like, I actually, I have a draft for a victory system that should work. I don't know if it's going to make sense to, to put it in yet. It could. I'm not, I'm not against it. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's battling. Um, and then uh, the other thing I want to talk about was how the actual, like, sessions adapt, uh, which is what we're working on right now. So basically, at the start of every game, I'm going to take this. Mm-hmm. You'll have a card that looks like this that has a lot of text on it. I know you can't really see it, but just this is a card that has text on it. And the cards might be like, do you want to be a separatist or do you want to like conduct the galactic survey? And these are like the very first two cards that you look at when you're playing the game and you like haven't even set the board you're like, okay, am I like a professor type or am I like a survivalist or whatever? And you'll, you'll choose your plot line and this other card just goes away. And then on this card, it will give you, hey, this is what you need to do to this game. This, these are your objectives, your missions, how you're going to generate points. And then if you succeed, this is what happens. So then we play the whole game. At the end of the game, over the course of the game, we've been gaining power. These like black little black cubes are power. They're victory points, basically. And we're going to gain a bunch of power. Sometimes for completing your, your chapter, you gain extra victory points. Sometimes you don't. Um, and then at the end of the game, uh, we, we go through this cleanup phase, which is a lot simpler. So here I'll, I'll show y'all. Um, oops. You can compare this document to the Oath Chronicle pack-up aid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, this is a lot simpler. And I know that some of that is we haven't tested it. No graphics, yeah, we haven't blah, tested blah, blah. It. It'll, it'll be a full sheet. There'll be more words on it. Don't worry about that. But fundamentally, it's like... It'll be five, maybe eight steps max, as opposed to like 13. Yeah. Um, and what, what happens at the end of the game is you resolve this card. Did you do the thing? Like, hey, you said you were going to conduct the big planetary survey. Did you finish it? And depending on if you finished it or didn't finish it, it will shut you to a new opportunity in the game. And so then the, the second step of pack up is like, okay, good job, professor. You finished it. Now you need to build the library. Here's how you build the library. Or... At the start, or you'll have a pivot. Can you hand me one of those, like, pivot ones? Like, oh, yeah, you know those. You, you, you had it. You had it. 
Sorry, there's there's cards all over this, this <laughs> place. So, you know, I've got like, on one hand, I have like, ooh, I'm going to build a library. And on the other hand, it's like, uh, be the mad scientist. You want to break a planet in half? And you're like, oh, okay. So you're always going to be confronted with the choice of one or two narrative options for your primary, like, victory condition. And you can pick whichever one you want, and then you progress to the next game, and you have that thing. Now, these cards will change the composition of anything in the game. They, they, can, they can add new units. They can change your text. They can, they can really shape the, the, the whole game. Um, and then after you decide what you're going to do, my, one of my favorite things that you do in this game is the step uh, three and four. You have to pay an upkeep for your game position, and you pay uh, victory points. So, like... I've always been kind of dissatisfied with victory points as an idea because I think oftentimes they aren't defined. It's like, I don't know, it's, there's scrolls. Mm -hmm. you, you won with the most scrolls, yeah. right? And in this game, it's like, no, victory points are power. And I'm, that's not like, that's what they are. It's power. And what are you going to spend power on? Maintaining your board presence. So if you have a big army, you're going to spend a bunch of your victory points maintaining that big army. And then if you have leftover victory points, you have to spend down to zero and you can buy text. You can take little bonus actions that happen kind of in the phase between games. So let's say you really wanted to build that factory. You couldn't quite manage it. Spend some of your victory points on it. And then during the last game, you're going to have a victory condition that uh, is going to give you at the very, during act three, this is going to say like, this is how you win the game. You win the whole campaign. And if you don't get this done, if nobody completes their victory objective, the player who secured the most power in that last game is going to win. So th that is the, the, the core condition is always like, get the most power. But that is superseded by the narrative mm -hmm. conditions. Yep. Now, one of my favorite parts of this is sometimes the dice aren't with you, bad things happen to good people, etc. And so if you fail these conditions, the failure conditions are where like the real goofy stuff comes up in the game. And that brings me to this, this feature that I'm really, really excited about. And it was one of those things that I thought about, like, for a long time, I was asking myself, is this even going to be in the dang game? Because it seemed, uh, like, off, um, off base or something. But um, some of the victory conditions, if you activate them, will ask you to go in your, like, single ship mode. So, like, on the back of every player board is, like, the Vagabond mode. And when you do the Vagabond mode, so like these top slots here, these are your buildings. These are like the buildings that you can build. And when you're in Vagabond mode, you can't build buildings anymore. You are now like the single little apple cart flying around <laughs> doing the Vagabond. You have, you have different rules. You're like trying to improve your hold. You can build armor. You can get different equipment on your ship. Yeah, put two hyperspace engines on the apple cart. Do, do yeah, 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 so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's how space travel works. Um, and that... One of the things that, um, from the very beginning of when we first started working on the game, uh, the, the I wanted the action system to be very fluid and interactive because I knew that there was going to be a scenario where one player was going to be, and in my mind I was like, the single ship trying to like find a new galaxy and the evil empire trying to control the entire board. How do you get those two player positions to interact in mm -hmm. a meaningful way? Yep. Well, there are two ways that you do it. One way is you create an interactive core action system. And then the other way, and we haven't really talked about this, but players will always have a, um, like, this is, I'm, I'm now being a, a little rambly, but, um, so th there are a number of ways to do it. I'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, is what, what I'm going to say. But basically, you have, to, you have to build other systems of interaction so that you can have those things set up. And that really, that brings me to kind of the very core of, of the design, which is something that I, I told to Kyle when I was talking to him about, or, or I didn't tell Kyle, we were just discussing it. Um, one of the things that's really important to me is that a lot of our games are very political in nature and very fighty. And I think that's great. I love political games, obviously. Um, but with ARCs, I, I think I wanted to make sure that the cool world that Kyle and I are building out, mostly Kyle, uh, was really lived in. And there were a lot of different things they could do. So it didn't always just come down to like, God, get big guns, shoot other person with big guns. It's like, no, like my whole plot line was like about rescuing refugees. And like I was trying to build like 
the Garden of Babylon, like in a nebula. And I was like trying to steal from everybody. Mm -hmm. And these plot lines interacted so that it had a much more, a much larger narrative imagination that wasn't necessarily political. Um, and so th that's one of the real cores of the design. And in order to do that, we have to do a little bit more handholding. So the thing I was going to mention earlier is, you know, you have these little these little narrative cards, which are kind of holding your hand and saying, "Hey, this is your mission. You got to do this thing." Um, there are lots of different ways that these can be done, and players have a lot of freedom. And one, one thing I, I I've told people is, you know, uh, if Oath is often about like why. This game is about like how, mm -hmm. like how do you actually do that and the operational details of doing it. But then in addition, at the start of the game, uh, players will be drafting these foil cards, which respond to the victory conditions that people have picked. So if some person is playing like the technocrats, someone else might be playing the knowledge thief. And this gives them like a soft encouragement to say like, hey, you, we're gonna reward you for directly interacting with this, this player and kind of playing villain to their story. Um, and it's it's a it isn't like handholdy, but it um, but it does provide like a little bit of narrative shape to a system that's otherwise so able. Yeah, well, one thing that I found that some players can find difficult in Oath is like, okay, we're in this game. There's the Chancellor of these exiles. Like, how should I like relate to my other exiles? Like, what 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 what's our like? Um, one one thing that I uh, love telling new players is like, yeah, like if you're an exile, like openly collaborate like you know there, mm -hmm. there, there are points in times where that makes a lot of sense but it takes a big push sometimes to be like hey you can like th there are um open very narratively fulfilling ways where you can uh, interact with each other that the game doesn't necessarily like put right in front of you from the mm -hmm. beginning and this is a nice way especially for a lighter game that's just like hey like here's a way that you can think about your relationship with this character uh, with this other player in the game. So. Yeah, so a few questions from chat. Someone said, can you pivot? This card says pivot on it uh, nice. at the bottom. <laughs> um, ba at the, basically, in between each game, when you're picking your condition, you can change your condition to something else. So if you think about, you know, in Oath, there's a main victory condition, and then you might encounter a vision, which offers you a different victory condition. And this, it basically says, like, hey, uh, you're going to get two choices. There are going to be two moments in the game, after the first session, after the second session, where you can change what you want your primary condition to be. Uh, so there are pivots there. And then also, these conditions sit on top of the game's regular victory condition. And there, there are potentially going to be some other ways that, that players can uh, pivot as well. We're still kind of figuring out what the size of the foundation of the house is that we're building. Because there might be a couple other ways where players can like, I really don't like any of the choices I've been getting, and I don't want to play the standard victory condition. Is there something else I could be trying to do? We, we might in insert something like that. Yeah, that's all the templating questions we were talking about earlier about like, okay, what are the levers we have or the hooks that we have to create different narrative structures? Like that's right. one part of that template. And, and, and other, so uh, someone asked like, well, other players know what you're doing. Yes, generally these cards are revealed pretty early on, and some of them are revealed right at the start of the game, so you just absolutely know what what each player is trying to do. Especially when it comes to the final victory condition, where you have to be reacting to those players, those things are known generally like right right away. Now, someone else asked a question, which I'm going to scroll up because I don't want to miss it. Oh, yeah. So, how many different missions are there? Will there be enough replayability, etc.? Okay, so this is like a big, huge question. Um, what I'm trying, what I want to do is so for first the, uh, okay here's how I want to answer this question first there's a question about uh, philosophy which is what is the philosophy of the game when it comes to its own replayability fundamentally the approach that I'm trying to bring to this is similar to something like faster than light which is to say if you've played a lot of FTL you kind of know the beats you know that there are these different plot lines that can happen but they mix in really interesting ways and so as you become familiar with the beats that the game hits, you actually get more invested in like, oh, and then like this narrative switch turned on and then mm -hmm. that one didn't turn on. Um, and so, you know, I, one way of thinking about this is like imagine a switchboard of like 20 switches. There's a huge range of binary possibilities yep. just in terms of what are being switched on or off, right? And so I want to try to bring that kind of ethos, that kind of philosophy of play into, into the design where even after you know a plot line, you're gonna feel like, I kinda of wanna try a different way of doing that particular plotline. Um, 
So that's, that's one kind of answer. The more specific answer is that right now, I'm hoping that there will be eight main plot lines and probably 10 or maybe 16 supplementary plot lines that are gonna be shorter or longer depending on where they come in the, in, in the arc. Now, when I say a plot line, I literally mean like the eight origin points. And this is a very useful number because at the start of the game in a four player game, everybody gets two origins and they decide which origin they want. So that single origin point has probably 20 unique cards anchored to it in a kind of like flow chart arrangement of different like, you know, you've got that one and then that one and they come with these different texts. So even with eight, multiply eight by 20 already, we're getting to a yep. lot of unique cards. Yeah. Even though, so like, this is why I wanted yeah. to program because I could be like, well, there are eight different plot lines and it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't sound like very much, but no, it's like there are eight different plot lines. There are eight different yep. like stories. Now, one of the things that I love about this design is uh, usually when we work on games, we have a um, like very like YOLO mentality of like, we're happy that we're working on it. We're just going to imagine this is the only time we're ever able to do it. Let's get it all on the wall. Yep. Uh, but that sometimes kind of screws us because like Oath is, hard, is very hard to expand because so much of what we wanted to put in Oath is just in Oath. Mm -hmm. This is the first game I've ever built where the core design can be expanded. Because you can get an expansion, imagine, that it has, let's say, two or four new plot lines. And all you do is you take the four origin cards and you mix them in with the eight origins you already have. And the rest of the game is self-indexed, mm -hmm. basically. And so it, it's just fundamentally different from, like, expanding like oath where it's like well we're, we're out of space in the box yeah, or... every every system is interlinked to every other one in such a way that there are not really places where you can kind of <laughs> bolt anything on it's yeah. very difficult so to... so what i'm hoping that we do with the kickstarter campaign um and and I, who knows if this, if this is going to happen this way but what i'd like to do is that we have the main box which has like eight plot lines in it and then the expansion has like four plus some extra stuff maybe and so for Kickstarter backers, you'll kind of get it all together. So you'll have 12, which is a just huge number. I mean, I have, like right now, there are only four plot lines that exist for this game. And it is so many cards. And I have played it a bunch. And I'm still like, no, I kind of want to run that plot line more. Um, so yeah, that that's hopefully, hopefully gives you a full picture of how much content there's going to be in the box. Yeah. There's a very real chance that this game has more cards than Oath. Yeah, which is uh, a little scary. Which is a little a scary. Little scary but... Don't worry, Kyle. <laughs> the art request is not that high. <laughs> it's not, it's not as high. And it, it, that, that I, I don't mind you know, peeking behind the curtain here and just saying the reason that's the case is because these plotline cards probably won't need unique illustrations. Yep. Um, th we might be able to do like, you know, there are some kind of clever illustration tricks that we can potentially do with them. Um, but we're like, it's the improvements that are going to have illustrations and things like that. Um, whoo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was a big <laughs> info dump about this thing we've been working on. I will say, uh, th this game started, uh, I started working on it seriously, like about a year ago. So it's been cooking for a really long time and I'm so excited for you to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, it's great that the studio now is in a point where we can kind of have all of these different creative tracks going at a time and just kind of mostly allow you to get that early stage design where you can focus and then bring in the studio after a lot of good core design has happened. It, so. it was so nice to like work on this, get frustrated, and then like, I'm gonna go play Ahoy. Mm -hmm. And just walk and be like, or you know, Nick would come to my office and be like, I have an Ahoy problem. Or I would come in his office and say, I've got an ARCS problem. And it was, we were giving such breaks to each other. Yep. It was really nice. Um, and that's that's the design where it's at. It's got a long way to go. We didn't really talk about like the alignment system. There's all all sorts of little bits and bobs in the in the design. Um, I'm trying really hard. Basically, where it's at right now, I can see it getting 10% more complicated, but nothing beyond that. So like, I really think it is. I, I feel like I know its shape, and I know the conversation I want to have with someone when I'm at a convention talking to them about the game, and I'm going to be trying to keep the design to, in that within that scope. Uh, <laughs> Q-tips and carbolin. That's right. Uh, okay. Are there any? Uh, are there any questions? We should go soon. 
Uh, we've been talking a little long, but I'm happy to take some final It's like questions. there's a DevOps, the name of the DevOps book author. Oh, yeah. So uh, the DevOps book, it's super weird. Do you, have you like looked at these books? I haven't that? read that one specifically, but I know, yeah. The, it, so <laughs> the Phoenix Project, I, I'm going to really go into like tech bro mode here. This is a weird <laughs> novel. So basically they have like a management and project management technique, which they decided to communicate th to people through a novel mm -hmm. about an imaginary company. I just I'd watch the GDC talk myself. Yep. That's that's you know, and then this is the more business businessy book about it. But uh, it's by um, Gene Kim, Jeff Hum, uh, Jez Humble, sorry, Patrick uh, Du Bois, and John Willis. Uh, it's great. It's really smart. Um, it the, the 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 place where it got me. Josh sent me this video originally, and the uh, the the place that it got me was um, when they were talking about waste and how like. Sometimes you think you're doing something heroic or beautiful or interesting, but you're actually just generating a shit ton of waste. And I was like, oh, I'm feeling a little caught mm -hmm. up here. Yep. Um, also, because it's on the shelf, if you haven't read Hiro Miyazaki's Starting Point, this book's lovely. Uh, just a collection of interviews. It's, uh, it's whenever I'm feeling stuck. That's, where I, that's, the, that's the book I like to read. Um, rarest game you both own. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um... I've got it like right. Mm, that's a good question. Okay, Josh, you go first, or I, or I can go first if you want to. Ah, rarest game. Um, I had. I'm not sure exactly how how rare this is, but I have multiple editions of Successions, the like uh, multiplayer war game. Wait, successors. Uh, success successors. What what am I talking about? On my wall, I have a. Yep, exa exactly that one. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know how rare that game, that version of the game is. It's like the second the edition. One? I have the new one as well. Okay. I'm um, sure but yeah, the second edition successors is probably the rarest game I own. I don't really own that many games that are like hyper rare. So you, you probably have a better one than I okay, do. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna give you a few. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't forgot about our mystery piece. Don't worry. <laughs> this is Crusoe's Planet, a game designed. Uh, Leptopolis games? I don't know. Um, it is a three to eight player, low complexity, two to four player economic simulator <laughs> with like a socialism mod. It's wild. <laughs> and it, it like, it is so, this is one of the weirdest designs ever and it's kind of awesome. But it is a, uh, it's almost like a classroom exercise mm -hmm. for like macroeconomic students. Very cool. Um, not expensive. This is what I think this game cost me $5. Um, and it was just really, really, really hard mm, to find mm -hmm. because it was, you know, the person was like selling them out of the garage. But the real rarest game that I have is this. This is the oh, extremely, yeah. uh, th this game took me, no joke, like eight years to find. <laughs> this is the first edition of Lords of the Sierra Madre of which only like a hundred were made. They were all like printed at NASA. Did it and actually Tucson. come in this? This is this how it came. Wow, there that's is, absurd. I haven't opened it in a while. There is a letter that's like, you know, we thank like the NASA printers that we printed this on and we're so happy that you, you bought our weird game. This took me a long, a long time to find, but it, it is here. Uh, I have never played it. I have read the rules. Uh, but I, I've got lots. Of, I, I love I love weird things. Yeah, this is yeah, the first Paul, edition. Paul is the first to ask first for that edition. question. <laughs> so there's not. Oh, I, I like the saga of me finding this game was insane. It was like the longest, the longest saga. Um, but we won't get into it. There is. Uh, it's somewhat more common. Um, there is a Pancho Villa war game mm -hmm. that is a cutout from from the, the full game that is really 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 good. That was I also have a copy of uh, somewhere around here. Um, I don't know. Unpunch Magic Realm, that's a Whoa. good find. Um, Marauder, one fulfillment. Oh, yeah, okay. So, we didn't talk about Marauder for a I can't say anything to you uh, because uh, w w uh, that is for the ops team to announce. Uh, they have good news. It's all good news. But basically, uh, production is uh, complete and it is in the, you know, it's moving. I don't know. In uh, the shipping realm. Yeah, like I, I could not tell you <laughs> if it was in China or on a boat or some of it was in China and some of it was on a boat. It's big enough that there's many, many containers. Um, they are putting together a Kickstarter update, which will be out, pro I would guess, within the next week or two, you'll be getting a Kickstarter update that will have some pretty firm estimates about when these things are going to be coming. But so, so, so soon. 
Um, okay. And lastly, where's this piece from? It's from 504. Every hey. every developer's favorite tool. <laughs> Here's my copy of 504. It's like the second or third one I've owned. Harvested for pieces. Actually, all the wooden pieces that I have out here are 504 pieces. Um, so there you have it. Okay, and you know the winner can get uh, I don't know Kyle's voice on their voicemail or something. Um, all right, that's it for us. I don't think there are any other Oof. final questions. We went a little long, but oh well. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year to everyone. We are so excited that we get to work on these games uh, for you all. And you'll be hearing a lot more from us in coming weeks. Uh, there were several questions about ARC's playtesting. Uh, we're probably at least two months out from any kind of public playtesting. Maybe three. Um, and it's just because I'm having a lot of fun working in physical space on this game. And I don't want to make a mod in some kind of yeah. software yet. And now that the studio is coming back... From Ahoy, basically, you have many more people who you can just start. Yeah, just start. Through like, yes. Yeah, so. so, and, and yeah, that's something that we didn't talk about. I won't go into too long, but as Ahoy closes down, like I get your time, Josh, and I get Kyle's time again, and we, we can start kind of re piecing together, yep. piecing together the team. Okay. Well, thank you all for watching. Thanks, I hope everyone. you have a wonderful Tuesday.